pigmentation is up there with acne when it comes to popular topics on my channel. And there is so much that can be done now with skincare to make improvements in your skin if you're prone to this problem. However, there's also lots of bad information out there that you can fall prey to. And above all else with this channel, I want to help teach you to master your own skin. So today I'm gonna to be busting the top six pigmentation myths to help you get your skin on the right track. Myth number one, if I'm indoors, I don't need to wear sunscreen. Now, I saw this myth busted wide open with my very own eyes during the pandemic when I would see lots of my patients on Zoom. And the interesting part was I would get to see them in their workspace where they'd set themselves up to work at home. Now, frequently, this would be by a window, we all naturally gravitate towards light. And I would see, literally with my own eyes, the consequences of that daily UVA exposure that was often not thought about. So you would start to see patterns of pigmentation that correspond with that more focal pigmentation on the neck, on the lower jaw, kind of going down into the neck area. And that was because of this insidious creep of UVA rays, something that we're often not even conscious of because we're looking at ourselves in the mirror every day and it actually takes a photograph to be taken some months apart from another photograph to really see the difference. The other thing to remember, of course, that those UVA rays are the very same ones that will steal your elastin. That's the stuff that makes your skin snappy and is essential if we want to stay, keep our skin looking tight and taut. So wear the damn sunscreen indoors or outdoors. Myth number two, I need more exfoliation to eliminate my pigmentation. Gosh, no. Now this reminds me of a case when I was presenting a TV show for TLC called Extreme Beauty Disasters, where someone from Northern Ireland, my home place, came on the show with melasma. And she'd originally gone to see her local esthetician with some pigmentation, and she had helpfully suggested that she have some microdermabrasion. And whenever it didn't improve at the first session, she thought she needed to do more microdermabrasion and so on. And despite all of that, the pigmentation got worse and worse. So the reality is that pigmentation prone skin needs to be handled with care. And exfoliation, whether physical or chemical, is a fairly blunt instrument when it comes to improving hyperpigmentation. We can do better. Myth number three, once it's gone, it's gone. Alas, this tends not to be the case with those who are prone to pigmentation whatever the cause, especially if you have Fitzpatrick phototype three to six with darker skin tones. So if you think about an acne blemish in darker skin tones, typically the mark that follows the blemish will last longer than the blemish ever occurred for in the first instance. And likewise, if you develop melasma, which again is more common in darker skin tones, you will find that that's typically a chronic condition and can last to the order of years, even decades. So the moral of the story here is you need a maintenance strategy. Myth number four, hydroquinone is toxic. Now that word gets used a lot these days. Hydroquinone is a drug that's available on prescription in the UK to treat hyperpigmentation, most commonly melasma. And it's something that is safe. It's been studied extensively. Um, it's been approved for medical usage in the right setting. And I think that's what's really key here, the right setting. It's also about where you source it from. A lot of the kind of fear around hydroquinone use stems from the fact that it's been formulated in non-medical settings and it's been procured over the counter often found to be in much higher percentages than we would use on prescription. At the end of the day, everything is potentially a poison when used in the wrong dose, even water. So the key message here is if you have pigmentation and you want to get advanced treatment for it, see a doctor, get it diagnosed correctly and have them prescribe it for you. Myth number five, if I avoid the sun, I won't get pigmentation. Whilst UV rays and visible light, including particularly the high energy blue part of the light spectrum, 
are the most common causes of pigmentation in the skin. We also have to contend with hormones as a driver towards pigmentation in those who are susceptible. So pregnancy, IVF, contraception, these are all instances where hormones can wreak havoc with the evenness of our skin tone. Likewise, friction and fiddling can trigger pigmentation. And I'll often see this in acne sufferers who can't help but investigate their skin. And I can usually tell if somebody's been fiddling, it tends to create more intense pigmentation than would otherwise naturally occur. And then of course, the inflammatory process itself, something we see in acne, rosacea, eczema, and so on can also cause the skin to become darker. So those are instances where UV rays aren't the primary driver, but UV rays on top of those things will make the pigmentation more intense. Myth number six, you need lasers if you want to get rid of it. Hmm, this very much depends on what you're treating in the first instance. And I'd argue that there is a case for skincare as the first line of attack whatever the underlying cause. So if we think about acne, certainly lasers is not something we reach for in the first instance. We tackle the problem, we get it under control, and then we work on post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation at the same time as controlling the acne because there's overlap, retinoids, azelaic acid, both of which will help with both controlling the disease process, but also improving the evenness of the skin tone. So we certainly don't dive in with procedures um, until we really have to, and we've worked out that we've actually maxed out the capacity of a topical regime to improve the quality of the skin. And for many patients, they're so happy with the improvement in glow, clarity, and radiance that comes from using those ingredients on their skin, plus their acne's control, that procedures really aren't something they want to think about. When it comes to melasma, again, lasers are certainly not first line. They're not even really second line. Um, these days we use topical therapy. We might add in something oral, tranexamic acid, if that's not working by itself. And really lasers are third line for those who are really recalcitrant, who haven't responded as we'd hope. And then we caveat it because lasers can sometimes potentially make matters worse, or perhaps more commonly, you have the, the laser, things get better, but then you accidentally have some intense UV exposure and you're back to square on again. So I think the relapsing, remitting nature of melasma means that really we're better off trying to get a handle on what we do every day to keep matters controlled. When it comes to tackling the sun damage, so things like solar and tigos, I think lasers do, of course, then have a place, potentially. But I still think you're always going to be better off doing the work with retinoids, antioxidants, pigment suppressors, so hydroquinone might have a role to play, and seeing where you get to. That's what I tend to do in, in, in my practice, because at the end of the day, those things will have a much more holistic um, effect on how the skin looks, making everything look brighter and glowier. And again, as the kind of optics of the skin improve, I think the concerns around pigmentation tend to lessen. You can always go in with some IPL or a more targeted pigmentation laser at a later point in time. Um, and certainly you'll see great results with that. But in the first instance, I think you can do a lot of the heavy lifting with topicals alone. I love treating pigmentation guaranteed to make someone feel good that while you're working in that pigment, you're also working with radiance and their confidence. And that's what this is all about. So tell me, have you learned something in today's video? If you have, please let me know by leaving a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this debunking video, do watch my debunking video on the top anti-aging myths. I'll see you again soon, guys. Bye for now.